Thank you, Lou. Appreciate it. Hello, folks. Time for Facebook Live. It's Wednesday, just a little bit after the hour. Had some technical difficulties there. I appreciate <clears throat> pardon the work of Lou DiVizio to get us going here. We'll be talking with, <clears throat> pardon me again, William Mulhado, reporter for the Santa Fe Reporter, one of the wonderful papers in Santa Fe. And I have to nod our note our good friend Julianne Grimm, who's the editor and publisher of the paper, and she's been a wonderful guest for us on New Mexico in Focus. But today, we're going to be talking with William about the interesting Yazi Martinez lawsuit. What's going on? Because the Santa Fe Reporter is just busting out an interesting series, including an article today we'll be talking about here. So William, thank you. Welcome. I understand you are down from Denver, uh, the Denver area in Colorado, and welcome to New Mexico. Hey, thanks so much, Gene. Yeah, really happy to be here. Absolutely. Do us a favor and it, it, just a quick synopsis of what brought us here to this ruling and where you want to go with the series. Yeah, so um, I guess uh, the ruling in 2018 by Judge Sarah Singleton uh, was essentially a uh, indictment of the state's public education for failing to provide a adequate, sufficient education to at-risk students, um, which, which was specifically for student populations, um, Native children, students receiving special education services, children from low-income families, and students who are learning English. Um, and uh, in 2014, uh, the state ruled that education was a, a constitutional right. And so by failing to provide adequate education, the, the state was violating the, the constitutional right of, of these children. And that wasn't a new uh, you know, discovery. Uh, people had been you know, talking about New Mexico's education for you know, decades. Uh, it was just at the point that you know, advocates finally realized the change was only going to happen if, if they kind of held the state, state to the state's feet to the if, to the fire through the courts, and and so um, that ruling happened in, in 2018, and, and a lot has happened since then. Um, but uh, there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Good points there. What made you folks at the Santa Fe Reporter uh, decide you wanted to take a deep deep dive into this? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really interested in education. I, I was before I, I joined the Santa Fe Reporter. I worked as a teacher um, uh, for about five years, mm -hmm. and um, education in New Mexico is fascinating because you have um, simultaneously some of the most incredible um, uh, education happening in classrooms across the state, and mm -hmm. um, some really amazing educators that that I had the opportunity to speak with and, and and learn from, and then you know on its face a lot of people criticize and, and really focus on the deficits of New Mexico's classrooms, and and so I was kind of interested in how both of those two things can can exist at the same time, uh, and and I think a lot of it really was just coming back to the, the Yaza Martinez lawsuit, um, and and I wanted to take a look at okay what has the state done and and how um, have some of those remedies either been um, well received or perhaps not fully implemented and, and kind of where what do we need to go mm -hmm. you know interesting um you're right about the vast amount of money the state has invested in education since the ruling it's an interesting a uh, bit there but add to that a uh, fundamental transformation of the schooling system is still needed that comes across clearly in the writing here what would that look like in your view if that transformational thought was actually put on the ground here I, I was just talking with with um, uh, one of the individuals who uh, kind of worked a lot on the M Martinez side of the the case about what transformative education would look like, and 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 they said that um, kind of one of the things that needs to happen immediately is looking at our students from like an asset based um, lens. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, looking at English language learners, not looking at their um, maybe not fully developed English as a barrier, but really as an asset as, oh, wow, this, this child already has a language that they can communicate in. Uh, and, and that kind of is a, is a the philosophical uh, shift that, that teachers and schools uh, and, and the public education department um, has to make. Um, but also the uh, basic transformation of, of, of schools has been outlined by um, both the Yazi and the Martinez plaintiffs uh, and their kind of advocates through various plans, um, one of which is the um, uh, travel remedy framework. And, and one of the things that kind of has been interesting is that the state has not been as um, forthcoming with a kind of comprehensive plan to transform education as I think advocates would have liked. Uh, there was a plan that was 
um, drafted by uh, former uh, Education Secretary Veronica Garcia, um, but we haven't seen that yet, um, despite the fact that, that we were told it would be um, available prior to the most recent legislative session. Uh, so, so I think that that has been one thing that, that people have been pointing to and, and kind of asking, where is this plan? And, and so all the money that we've invested is, um, you know, without a blueprint, so to speak. And, and I think that has some people concerned. Yeah. Interesting in your story, in your reporting that uh, it, it, we should note Ms. Garcia was paid for that study as well. Mm -hmm. So you would think there'd be some incentive to get that information out, you know, and not a small amount of money either, uh, I might add. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, when I spoke with um, uh, uh, now Secretary Kurt Steinhaus of the Education Department, he, he mentioned wanting to really just dial that plan and make sure that it's, you know, as, as accurate and as, uh, you know, best, as good as possible for, for those students. And, and, and I think that there certainly is uh, you know, a good reason to, to spend the time to make sure that that all of those students are getting the service need. But, uh, you know, other people have also mentioned, you know, we could have done a lot since 2018 that necessarily hasn't um, happened yet. Good point there. We're talking with William Milhado from the Santa Fe Reporter about the Yazzie Martinez case and their long form reporting on the uh, ramifications of this. I'm going to recommend you go to the Santa sfreporter.com to try and check this out. Um, checking in on a couple of things. I'm curious, William, where you think possibly the pandemic played a role in this? It, it was, is it significant? Did it, did it really put a chain on all of this? Or what happened during the pandemic? Yes. I mean, certainly it's kind of uh, impossible to not discuss and, and, and incorporate um, the ramifications of the pandemic in, in this topic, you know, it, it has made teaching, uh, running schools, everything incredibly difficult um, and, and certainly has probably delayed a lot of some of the efforts that the PED and, and advocates have, have hoped to enact to address educational inequities. Um, one thing that, that I think is interesting about it is that, you know, the pandemic revealed really fully to us how expansive the digital divide is in terms of the lack of technology, the lack of broadband infrastructure across the state, which, you know, of course was necessary when schools went remote. But before schools went remote, you know, 21st education, uh, 20, education in the 21st century, you know, required internet access. You know, students need to have those skills, needed to have those skills before the pandemic. But of course, you know, when, when that was the only way for students to access class, it was um, really uh, apparent how, how unequal education had become in, in the state in, in just that regard. And, and in uh, December of 2020, the Yazi uh, plaintiffs filed an emergency motion for uh, uh, relief to essentially get technology to all those students, um, which is obviously a huge task. And, and there have been major improvements and in, in, in but there are still students that, you know, don't have reliable internet access or, or you know, don't even have reliable electricity, uh, which is another, you know, larger issue. That's right. Good points there. Um, the broadband issue, of course, got addressed in during the session. Uh, I don't recall Yazi Martinez being mentioned a whole lot during that. Maybe it's because the money just sort of unfolded and it re really wasn't that big of a controversy. But in your reporting, is there a sense of a little hurry up mode now for, for connectivity? Has this spurred something uh, out there? Yeah, I, I think it has. There, there's been a, a lot of money allocated for broadband infrastructure, um, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the, the hard thing is, is that uh, New Mexico is, is uniquely uh, challenge, difficult to, to put in that broadband infrastructure because of um, not only our really diverse kind of geography, but also our kind of um, land, different types of land um, ownership and, and all that kind of adds to the challenge. And, and it's not a quick, easy solution to this, um, this issue. There, there is enormous amounts of like construction and, and just like physical wires that need to be placed in the ground right. before um, before people can get connected and and it just it just does take time but at the same time you know they they need to uh, there, there needs to be more broadband access to these students if 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 we hope to you know continue providing an education that that 
students should be receiving in the 21st century. It really isn't an argument at this point, is it? And, and now it's just a question of get, getting it in the ground, as you say. And at a, what did I hear, a half million dollars a mile, whatever it is to lay fiber. We still have some challenges to get out the fifth largest state in our union, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm really interested in your in your thoughts on this standardized testing, big part of the story, uh, and always will be actually, uh, mm -hmm. because low scores are one of those data points highlighted in the ruling, and those standardized tests are now back after a two year pandemic break. I'm, I'm curious in your, in your reporting what you're finding on this because are kids better off than they were in 2018 with those with the testing that we have now? I, I know that's an opinion question, but I'm curious. <laughs> What, yeah, what are your I, thoughts on that? I, I can kind of just offer what what you know what we have and 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 sure. what I've heard. Uh, you know, standardized testing is for 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 better or worse what, what we've kind of hitched our um, our ride to in terms of assessing students. Not not entirely, but you know, especially under former Governor Susana Martinez, there was a lot of emphasis placed on testing to not only measure student proficiency, but also evaluate teachers' success, which is mm -hmm. problematic um, given the diversity of the state. But um, we still rely on standardized testing to inform us on how students are doing. And that was one of the things that Judge Singleton cited in, in essentially proving that, in, that, that education was insufficient is that you know students in those four groups uh, labeled as at risk were underperforming on those tests. Um, and, and there is certainly a lot uh, to be said about crit critiquing standardized testing for, for not actually assessing certain information, particularly for um, students who, who English is not a first language. Um, but uh, we have to kind of rely on some of those standardized tests to, to inform us, to inform how students are doing. And, and so, um, you know, the, the short term, um, in, in the short term, what, what PED has collected does not point to a, you know, a, a significant, significant gains for students um, because we were put on that kind of hiatus for um, probably a very good reason uh, during the pandemic, um, the, the public education department kind of relied on like short term interim testing to, to assess students. And, and those show decreases in, in math and reading where, where we typically assess students. Um, and, and I don't think anyone was particularly surprised by that. Parents and, and teachers all kind of observed what was possible in remote education. And for some students, it worked out really well. And for a lot of students, it, it didn't. So I think coming in, into standardized testing this year uh, will be a really interesting look at, at really what the pandemic has done to educational outcomes from, from that perspective. Um, and, and I think also will we'll kind of give us a, a perspective of for those particularly vulnerable students who were not receiving an adequate education before the pandemic to see um, kind of how the pandemic um, uh, impacted their, their learning. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as a teacher, you've been in the classroom, uh, of course, is, is there a better way? I know we have to benchmark where kids are before we can get them someplace. But in your view, is there a better way to assess student performance than, than standardized testing? Yeah, you know, that was a, that's, that's a question I, I really enjoy posing to other teachers because okay. I'm certainly not an expert. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of examples out there of alternatives to standardized testing, kind of portfolios that, that measure um, kind of a student's progress mm -hmm. and, and, and just more um, formative assessments, which is essentially uh, rather than one big at high risk test, kind of shorter weekly or, or more frequent, uh, less formal assessments. Mm -hmm. and, and so in addition to, to those, standardized testing does play a, a not insignificant role in, in assessing a whole child's um, kind of progress, uh, which is what we're looking at when we want assessment is, you know, how, how are they progressing in, in, right. in a grade? And, and so it's kind of, um, a multi, there's a lot of a lot of approaches that 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 schools and, and educators probably um, need to take, and it's not just a oh let's do this one uh, standardized test and, and call it a day. And I think the the the, the PED definitely recognizes that uh, that they've kind of the new standardized test they've switched over to from uh, Park, which was the test that um, uh, Governor Martinez uh, um, relied on. Um, they, their new standardized testing, which is New Mexico measures for um, student success and achievement, I believe, um, is, is a bit more uh, holistic in, in its kind of approach to 
um, looking at, at, at children and their progress. Mm -hmm. um, your work, speaking of which, your work also mentions a, that 2019 directive from the PED to create advisory councils. Got, you know, so we can get down, you know, a little closer to the ground in individual uh, areas and groups and such. Is that working? What's your uh, reporting showing? Yeah, I, um, I guess it depends on who you talk to um, yeah. in terms of those, uh, the efficacy of those those councils. And, and that was a part of kind of a, um, a multi-pronged approach PED took to addressing or really looking at equity at individual schools. And, and everyone that I've spoken to agrees New Mexico and all of its diversity will not um, you, you can't prescribe uh, one size fits all solutions or, or also, you know, make um, kind of assessments of, of how the, each the schools are doing because all they're all so different. Um, but the uh, advisory councils were, were tasked with essentially addressing and, and evaluating the, the amount of inequities and, and what serious needs that their individual districts had. Um, and, and reporting that I kind of came across showed that, you know, the buy-in from individual districts or, or um, local education agencies was, was not significant. Um, in addition to creating the councils, they had to produce deliverables, which were essentially items that, that were to assess equity or to come up with plans to, to make schools more equitable. Mm -hmm. And um, in one instance, only 50% uh, of, of districts in the state had, had submitted those. Um, in, in the case of other items, less than one fifth of, oh, of wow. districts. Really? So, yeah, and, and, and when I, you know, I, I brought those numbers to the PED, they, they were aware of them, obviously, and, and, and said, you know, it's, it, it, we're, we're working with districts to help them support them. It, it, it is hard because on one hand, it's, it's a mandate from the public education department, but at the same time, you know, public education department has to be careful not to, you know, try and force these districts mm -hmm. to do this and, and just kind of push them away from, from buying into this. Uh, equity work um, that, that they're asking districts to do. How about the tribal remedy framework uh, written by tribal and indigenous education leaders? You know, the framework, as you reported, was sent to the state. Can you explain what was included and how that, how was, how that plan was received? Yeah, um, so th there's been a number of kind of different like approaches to, to remedies, um, this being, being one of them that have mm -hmm. adv advocates and, and groups have contributed to the state and, and, and made suggestions. Um, the, the tribal remedy framework kind of particularly focused on um, giving um, tribal education departments more control over the education of, of native students, um, and relying on more kind of community-based education and, and, and providing um, curriculum that's more culturally and linguistically sustaining, which is what these tribal education departments have, have said we need in order to um, support our students. Um, and, and, and to some extent, some of those uh, remedies ha have been um, funded and kind of started uh, the, this year in the legislative session. Um, uh, tribal education or Indian education and, and tribal libraries saw, saw a lot more money. And that's a great step. I, I think from a lot of the people that I've spoken with, um, one of the biggest areas that they would like to see improvement on is, is just collaboration. And that's, I think, a um, maybe a bit of a kind of a, a vague uh, a, um, assessment, but at the same time, you know, it's really important that the state continue working with these uh, groups to, to make sure that, you know, every voice is included in this process. Uh, and it's certainly challenging, I think, to, to <laughs> realize that you know these groups have, have sued the state um, and the state obviously has responded um, through um, legal proceedings mm -hmm. but they still have to work together in order to, to get the state to a you know a, a more equitable place in terms of providing education good last point there exactly right hey you've got an article coming out today do i have that correct in the series yeah we just published one today uh mm -hmm. it's the um, sorry, I'm losing track here. Uh, I think the, the second uh, in the, or the third in the series, excuse me. Um, and this one is focusing on, on teachers uh, because, you know, a lot of people that, that uh, I, I speak with have, um, you know, really just doubled down on, on um, 
on communicating the importance of teachers. There's not really any other factors in schools, calendars, administration, curriculum that's more important on in terms of improving student outcomes than, than just quality of teaching. And, and, and like I mentioned earlier, New Mexico has some incredible educators. Um, and uh, at the same time, there's also um, significant need changes that, that need to be made in order to better support the students. And, and one of the things that came up uh, in my reporting was the need to um, train teachers to, to provide um, teaching that is uh, supportive of those developing English as a, as a second or, or third language. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in some cases in districts, uh, students identified as English language learners were, were placed in, in remedial um, reading programs uh, rather than actually provided with mm -hmm. um, rich curriculum that develops their education and develops their English. Um, so, so that's kind of an area that, that people have said um, universities that train teachers need to improve on, uh, and, and certainly um, the state uh, also has, has recognized the importance of teacher training, uh, and the, the, the big thing that, that we saw out of this legislative session was the 10K um, raise to teacher salaries, which is, right. everyone is arguing needed to happen a, a while ago, and it's great that it's happening now, um, but nonetheless, teachers are incredibly valuable, which we hear a lot, but um, it, it is a pretty nuanced discussion. How does, how does it impact teacher recruitment? That's also a big, huge problem here. We're not getting the pipeline on the front end of it filled as much as we would like to have teachers come out. And we're still, as we've reported here in New Mexico PBS quite often over the years, the loss of teachers after the first year or two is still a huge problem here. And I know you went through this yourself personally. <laughs> I was My ex-wife is a school teacher, and I can tell you that first year, I don't think I would wish it on anybody in any <laughs> profession. It's a very difficult position to be in. So where are we, where are we on, on teacher recruitment with all of the challenges your, you know, your series is exposing here? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the big number that we've seen probably reported, I know, I know I've reported it many times, is that you know, this year we had uh, over 1,000 teacher vacancies, which was over mm -hmm. double what we had in the previous year. So it certainly is a crisis. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, when uh, the uh, state filed a motion to dismiss the case in, in March of 2020, one of the things that they cited as a, as a reason to dismiss the uh, Yazi Martinez lawsuit was, was a, a decrease in teacher vacancy. But, but as we can see this year, that, that issue has not been resolved. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I, I guess I don't have a, a, a good um, sense of, of how um, teacher retainment is, is going to improve. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that, you know, increasing teacher salary it, is a pretty good start, just, just in the sense that it attracts more people to a profession that they might not have previously considered, and it retains those teachers who might be close to retirement age and think, oh, well, well I might as well keep teaching for a couple more years. And, and so, I think the, the educator pay is a pretty important part of that discussion. Uh, also, you know, going back to universities and, and helping support universities to make sure they are providing the support to those students to, to get through the process of, of becoming a teacher, um, which is no, no easy task if you're in the classroom or just getting ready to become, to be in the classroom. That's right. You know, draw, you know, trying to attract teachers to rural parts of our state has always been a challenge as well. It's, it's a real difficulty. Again, without that whole ecosystem you're describing around them, they end up feeling very alone, very underappreciated, you know, you know, not much parental input. It's a, it's a very difficult position to be in. And I have to thank you again for this series. It's very interesting reading and I put it on the highly recommended <laughs> deal there. We'll have a link in the thread below for sure. And William, I can't thank you enough. William Melhado from the Santa Fe Reporter, sfreporter.com. It is a series on where Yazi Martinez stands and where we might need to go in our education system. Thank you so much, William. I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Gene. No problem. We'll have you on again. Don't you worry about it. Great. Right, folks, we will see you Friday night at seven on Channel 5.1. It's going to be a great show this week as usual. We'll see you there.